All right, so we have a, yes, a lot to do today for class number 20. Um, hope to get it all in in 15 minutes, but it might be a little bit longer today. I should remind you that you should make sure you review Monday's topics, including not just in the book, but also in the mathematical notebooks. Understanding these facts symbolically, uh, what they mean and how to use them for proofs. I want to try to get to another proof today, though I'm not positive that we'll get to do the full proof. I'm going to try to do a full proof instead of an outline. That's one thing that's going to take a little longer. Um, so you see the sentence structure and that you learn how to practice that kind of thing in your proofs. But you should certainly go back and review these kinds of statements that I have. All right, what's today going to be about? Well, first of all, I introduced that matrix exponential idea on Monday. I want to go into more depth about it today. We're not going to be able to fully understand it. We want to get some intuitive understanding. But the most important thing to get out of it is to understand how it's related to differential equations. Um, but we need to think about some basic computations first if we're going to understand it better. I'm going to talk about a general matrix and how to classify what happens. Basically, a lot of statements that you see here. I'm not going to probably have time to go over all these, but maybe toward the end of class, we'll go over some parts that you see here. Lots of different factual statements with equations and inequalities that you should. These are all things you should know. We are going to consider a situation where eigenvalues are not real numbers. They're called complex numbers. There's complex eigenvalues and complex eigenvectors. And here I have some factual statements about those cases, though we will mostly focus on an example. And then at the end, we're going to, again, focus on a partial proof of part of this statement that you see here that will be, hopefully, we'll be able to give a full proof of part of that statement is my idea. All right, so let's start with uh, the matrix exponential and how it's related to um, differential equations. I call, I call it the, this is my name, I call it the beautiful generalization is what we're going to look at. And we're also going to relate it to flows and see some neat kinds of graphics that you can do with mathematical. All right, way down here I have a section for the matrix exponential. It's easiest to think about with diagonal matrices, but first I should probably write its formula on the board again. When you write it by hand, you write it like that. E to a matrix power. And again, initially it's like, what? Huh? What do you mean raise E to a matrix power? How do you make sense out of that? And the way to make sense out of it is with Taylor series. You, I hope you recall from Calc 2 that the Taylor series for E to the X, where X is a number, looks like this. That should be something that should seem at least vaguely familiar. And ideally, you remember this exactly. Okay? I'm not claiming everybody does, but that would be ideal if you could all remember it exactly. In summation form, it's an infinite sum. Turns out you can write it like this. Adding up x to the k power divided by k factorial. Hopefully you recall what factorial means. 4 factorial, for example, means 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Remember that? That's 24. 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 120. There's really a 1 factorial here, which is 1. And there's really a divide by 0 factorial there, huh? What? 0 fact? You can't divide by 0, right? Factorial. Yeah, zero factorial by definition equals one, believe it or not. Uh, and the reason is so that formulas like this work. Okay, there are other formulas that you want to work when you're calculating the zero factorial. And the way to make them work is to define zero factorial to equal one, even though it's kind of inconsistent with the other ones. Anyway, we just formally say, okay, well that works when x is a number, and this does converge for all x. What about if x is a matrix? Well, I can't use the number 1. I have to use the analogous form of 1 with matrices, the identity matrix. And by the way, A does need to be a square matrix here, 2 by 2 or 3 by 3 or 4 by 4. I would have to have the same dimensions. Imagine this in the 2 by 2 case, because that's what we're going to think about it for, at least right now. Replace the x with an A everywhere you see an x.
There is an issue about what does this mean exactly? What does it mean to raise a matrix to a power? And what does it mean for an infinite sum of matrices like that to converge? Let's get a little bit of intuition about that. Um, I do want to consider simpler matrices, diagonal matrices, and upper triangular matrices. But I think I'd actually like to consider this more complicated example first. So this matrix A is the exact same example from Monday where we have the sink. So there it is. There's the matrix A. Um, what would happen if I calculate I plus A, where I is the other <coughs> matrix, and if I type a capital I in Mathematica, that represents actually the complex number I. So I don't want to do that. Um, let's call it ID. I guess I don't really have to do this, but there is the 2 by 2 identity matrix. What happens if I add the first two terms in this series? I plus A. What do I get? How do you add matrices? You add them entry by entry. The upper left entries get added to each other to get the new upper left entry. 2 plus 1 is 3. Just what you would guess. You have to guess. 7 plus 0 is 7. That's the upper right entry for the sum. Negative 4 plus 0 is negative 4. Negative 9 plus 1 is negative 8. That's how you would add those 2 by 2 matrices. So if I want to add <coughs> I, D, and A, what do I get? <coughs> and actually, let's look at it in matrix form. I get that matrix, which I just said to you a minute ago. How close is that to E to the A? The matrix exponential, that's the, what this is called, the matrix exponential. I need to make that clear. Is that close to it? What does matrix X of A equal. Here's how you do it in Mathematica with matrix X. Well, hmm, it involves E. We saw this the other day. Is it close to this matrix? Are their there entries close together? Uh, it's hard to tell. Not so close. Well, it's because we have more terms in the series yet to do. What if I consider the, some of the first three terms? Two factorials, two. What if I calculate one half a squared and add that to it? Well, how do you calculate a squared? I can have Mathematica do it, but I probably should show you by hand. Again, a is the matrix 2, 7, negative 4, negative 9. I'm squaring that matrix, meaning multiplying it by itself. I haven't told you how to multiply matrices yet. I've told you how to multiply a matrix times a vector. Turns out the product of a 2 by 2 matrix times a 2 by 2 matrix is another 2 by 2 matrix. I won't get into details about when you can multiply matrices, but this should make intuitive sense. Do you just multiply component by component? No, you don't which maybe shouldn't be so surprising since when we multiply a matrix times a vector, we don't do that. We couldn't do that. So what do you do? Well, you, you treat each column of the second matrix like a vector and multiply the matrix on the left by each vector and put the answers in the columns of the new matrix. So for example, imagine multiplying this matrix times that vector. Same way as always, 2 times 2 is 4, plus 7 times negative 4 would be 4 minus 28, negative 24. That will be the first entry of the first column of the product matrix. What about the second entry of the first column? Cover that up. Look at the second row here, dot product with that column vector. Negative 4 times 2 is negative 8, plus negative 4 times negative 9 is positive 36. So negative 8 plus 36, that will be 28. Please catch me if I make a mistake. I better double check things. That's the first column of the product matrix. What about the second column? Cover up the first column of the 
second matrix here. Imagine multiplying the first matrix times this vector in the same way. So we have 2 times 7 is 14, plus 7 times negative 9, so we have 14 minus 63, negative 49. Double check that. Sound right? Then go to the second row here. Negative 4 times 7 is negative 28. That times that is positive 81. 81 minus 28 is going to be 53. Let's check it. On Mathematica, do you want to multiply matrices like this? Just like with matrix times a vector, you use a period, not a star. In Mathematica, if you use a star here, It'll do what you would have guessed if you didn't know about this. You would you multiply the entries, the corresponding entries. But we don't want to do that. We want to do a regular matrix multiplication. Use a period. Did I get it right? Looks good. All right, so if I do, going, coming back to this partial sum here, if I go ID plus A, ID plus A plus 1 half A squared, what about the one half? What happens there? Well, you, that you do multiply entry by entry. Take the scalar one half times a squared. You're going to get one half times the matrix negative 24, negative 49, 28, and 53. There you do multiply entry by entry. Negative 24 times a half is negative 12. Negative 49 times a half is negative 24.5. 28 times a half is 20 is a 14, and 53 times a half is 26.5. Can I just put the half next to a times a? That does work. Are we closer? Still not real close, comparing these two things. Mm. Is it going to be possible to get very close? Um. All right, I'll do some quicker, quicker calculations now. I'm going to calculate higher and higher partial sums, higher degree partial sums for this infinite series, and we'll continue seeing how close we get as we go. Compare the answers. What's the next term? 1 over 3 factorial is 1 sixth. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. Actually, you know what? I think I did this wrong. Yeah, you can't, you can't raise exponents on matrices. Yeah, I forgot about that. That's a mistake. Is that close? Is that close? No, but let's keep going. 3 factorial is 6, so I get 1 sixth times a times a times a, a cubed. Kind of far away, not as close as I was hoping. We may need to use a shortcut here. Ultimately, I'll we'll stop it. I must have accidentally done something. It's trying to access Wolfram Alpha. Four factorial is twenty-four. I tried an example like this the other day and it worked nicely. I think I picked a bad example. A little closer. Actually, there's a shortcut way to do matrix powers without typing out all the matrices. It's a thing called matrix power. Like if I want the fifth power of A, do that. All right, uh, let's see. I know a way I can fix this. Let's use a summation symbol. <clears throat> and pick different values of little n. Let's try picking little n equals 20. This matrix power thing is allowing you to do the matrix powers without actually multiplying them out. A dot, A dot, A dot, A, etc. Um, change your index. 
Oh, that's not looking good. <laughs> Hi on my face. You would, wouldn't you do matrix power with K as well? So you can... Yeah, okay. Thank you, you guys are catching stuff. Oh, that looks good, great, look at that. <laughs> Compare. It's working. <laughs> Thanks for catching my mistakes. Okay? Issues about convergence of these, this is kind of subtle. You have to get into what are called norms of matrices. We're not getting into that. This is enough intuition for us. Okay? But as far as what the answer looks like, that's hard to guess ahead of time, isn't it? It's pretty much impossible to. Can you guess what it looks like for simpler matrices? And the answer is yes, you can. Certainly for diagonal matrices. That's not diagonal. What's a diagonal matrix? It's a matrix whose non-zero entries are only on the main diagonal from upper left to lower right. Like that one. Yeah. What's e to the a for that one? What's matrix x of that? Hey, it involves e, and lo and behold, it's a diagonal matrix where the upper left entry is E squared, that thing. You're exponentiating that number. It's a new diagonal matrix. The power of the E is the same as the number there. 1 over E to the ninth is the same as E to the negative 9. Take that number and make it the power of the E. For diagonal matrices, the matrix exponential is simple. And to check it out, you can you can try it on your own with this formula. Let's try another example, make this a negative five and this a an eleven. Same kind of thing happens. What about upper triangular and lower triangular matrices? Well, what are they? First of all, an upper triangular matrix is a matrix where the only uh, zero, well for the two by two case. Uh, there's a zero in the lower left. The only non-zero things are above that upper triangular in the triangle in the triangular um, is a triangle inside this matrix. My finger's drawing it. That's your triangle of non-zero entries. Your only zero entries down there. Actually, this could be zero and you can still call it upper triangular. But in general, if you have a zero there and a non-zero number there, this triangle of non-zero numbers emphasizes that that's where your non-zero entries are, and this is called an upper triangular matrix. The matrix exponential in that case is also kind of simple, relatively speaking. <coughs> we still have the same numbers along the main diagonal as we have in the diagonal case. You got a non-zero uh, number there, and it's confusing how that might be related, related to the two. Uh, I don't want to get into that. I will just say that still it is an upper triangular matrix. And still the entries on the main diagonal are e to the power of the first entry there and the second entry there. The goal is not to fully understand this matrix exponential idea. It's just to see examples and make use of it. A lower triangular matrix would look like this, for example. And once again, you've got a similar kind of pattern. For matrices whose entries are all non-zero, it gets much harder to predict what it's going to be. Again, in this case, this matrix, okay, you could not predict, but that would be the answer without knowing a lot more than you know. All right. That took a lot of time. Oh, boy. <coughs> We're going to make use of the matrix exponential with flows, but I think I'd better do a complex eigenvalue example before I get into flows, which might be flows in the lurch as far as uh, time it needs. But we need to do a, a complex eigenvalue example. So our system in this example is dy dt equals ay, where a is the matrix negative 5, negative 1, 5, negative 3. That's your a. 
All right, let's compute the eigenvalues of A. Calculate that, which is again called the characteristic polynomial. And I don't know why they didn't just call it eigen polynomial since we're using eigen for everything else. Determinant of that matrix, which is going to be a quadratic function of lambda, the roots of which are the eigenvalues of the matrix. <coughs> Being careful about signs here. All these negatives end up making positives when you do multiplications. Looks like our characteristic polynomial is lambda squared plus 8 lambda plus 20. What are the roots of that? You could try factoring it. If you did, you would not be successful unless you use complex numbers. Because when you use the quadratic formula, set this equal to 0 and solve for lambda, you're going to get an expression that has a negative number under the square root. You're going to get negative 8 plus or minus square root of negative 16 times 2, or negative 4 plus or minus 1 half times the square root of negative 16. Yikes! Square root of negative numbers doesn't exist. So what do we do? It's, it's still a regular matrix with real number entries. We could still plot no clients for it. In fact, let's do that. And based on those no clients, we could still try to guess what solution curves look like. These are the no clients. The x no client is where that's 0. y equals negative 5x would be the corresponding equation. It's the green line. That's the x no client, where these solutions cross vertically. They're setting that equal to 0 gives you the y no client. Solving this equaling 0 for y would give y equals 5 thirds x. This orangish line is the y no client. Solutions cross it horizontally. Which direction do solutions go? Well, pick a point to start off with. Say you pick something on the y axis. x equals 0, y equals 4, say. That's the x dt, that's the y dt. If x is 0 and y is 4, that's negative. dx dt is negative. The graph's got to be moving to the left. If x is 0 and y is 4 there, you get a negative number as well. The graph has got to be going down as well, to the ultimately to the southwest here, it looks like. It's got to cross this x and l plane vertically. So if I start here, it's got to go down this way. It's got to cross the x and l plane vertically, and evidently it has to now start going to the southeast before heading toward the origin. What if we started over here? It turns out it would go to the northwest, cross the orange one horizontally before heading to the green one and crossing vertically before heading down toward the origin. It seems like there's some sort of sync behavior based on that. Let's go ahead and put the vector field in there and the stream plot. <coughs> yep, looks like a sync. Where are the straight line solutions, though? Doesn't look like there are any. Doesn't look like there's any line along which solutions head toward the origin on a straight line. The closest you can get is perhaps, perhaps in here somewhere, but uh, those are curved. That shouldn't be surprising. There are no real eigenvalues. So how do we deal with this? What do we, what do, we do? Can we find the general solution? The answer is yes, and the answer is you've got to use complex numbers. I stands for the imaginary unit and is often written as the square root of negative 1. In other words, I squared equals negative 1. What in the world is this? If you've never done this before, you kind of scratch your head. What? Is this allowed? That's called the imaginary unit. Does that mean it doesn't exist? If 
imaginary unit. No, it does exist. I'm creating it to exist. Which sounds really stupid, perhaps. But we'll see that it's got real life applications. So it's definitely still worthwhile to do. One real life application we're about to see is helping us find the general solution here. That's a real life application. This is a, that's a real problem there. There were no imaginary numbers to start with. If i is the square root of negative 1, I guess that means perhaps I can do this. You might scratch your head and wonder whether this is justified. Turns out it's fine. Square root of 16, regular square root is 4. 4 times a half is 2. What should I put for the square root of negative 1? Put an i. I've got two complex number eigenvalues, is what those are called, involving this imaginary unit i. Negative 4 plus 2i and negative 4 minus 2i are the two complex number eigenvalues. And you, you really don't have to worry about whether complex and imaginary numbers exist. They exist because we create them. We define them to exist and they create a new number system that is fully consistent, has all the same algebraic properties of the real number system, commutativity, associativity, distributive property, that all works. Inverses. But we need to say what does this mean for us? Are those really eigenvalues? Well, they will be eigenvalues if I can find corresponding eigenvectors. Non-zero vectors v that satisfy that equation. Or equivalently, non-zero vectors for v that satisfy this equation. Will the v be real vectors or complex vectors? Turns out in general they'll be complex. What would we have to do? Well, I shouldn't have erased this matrix here. I need to go do the same thing I do always, replace the lambda with one of those eigenvalues. Let's take this one, negative 4 plus 2i. What kind of corresponding system do I get? Replace the lambda with that and make that the coefficient of x in the first equation. Negative 1 is the coefficient of y. What does this simplify to? How you work with it? You take the negative 5 here, which is a real number, and you only work with it in relation to the real part of this complex number, that negative 4 right there. Negative 5 minus negative 4 is negative 5 plus 4 is negative 1. That's a real number. Its imaginary part is 0. It's like negative 5 plus 0i, if you like. So it doesn't really interact, so to speak, with the 2i. You just leave the 2i right there, right there as is. Solve this for y in terms of x. y equals negative 1 plus 2i x. So that means a corresponding eigenvector, if I've done things right, can be found by letting x equal 1, for example. And if x is 1, then y is negative 1 plus 2i. But is this a proof that we haven't made a mistake yet? No. Because really, the second equation should be equivalent to the first. Remember, we should. We're looking for non-zero solutions, which means this matrix had a zero determinant, which meant the rows are multiples of each other. What would happen if I used the second row here? Would I get the same, equ same equation or an equivalent equation? I get 5x plus negative 3 minus negative 4 plus 2i 
times y equals 0 doesn't look like it's going to be the same kind of thing. I make a mistake. I make a mistake. Do that. Why inside, right? Is that my mistake? Negative 1 minus 2i. Does that look good? This doesn't look like it's going to produce something equivalent. If you solve this for y in terms of x, I guess you get that. It doesn't look like the same thing. See what I'm trying to get at here? Remember, when you plug the eigenvalues into the two equations, you should get equations that are constant multiples of each other, of each other meaning the solution set is the same. It doesn't look the same here. Well, maybe that's just deceiving. I'm having a bad feeling about this. Everything look OK here? This could be deceiving. Maybe I need to simplify that number. Maybe I need to do this division, negative 5 divided by 1 minus 2i. That can be done with a little trick. To simplify that quotient so that there's no i's in the bottom, so maybe it, maybe it will equal that. Oh, I'm not feeling good about this. Let's see what happens, though. The trick is to multiply the top and the bottom of this by what's called the complex conjugate of the bottom. Take the bottom and change the sign in its imaginary part. Make it a 1 plus 2i. If I multiply it in the bottom by that, if I'm going to get the same number at the end, I've got to multiply the top by that as well, so that I'm really multiplying by 1. Why did I do that? Well, let's see what happens. Do what you would think you would do. For example, use the negative 5 here and distribute it through the parentheses there. That is the right thing to do. Negative 5 times 1 is negative 5. Negative 5 times 2i is negative 10i, just like you would guess. The great part about this is the bottom simplifies to a real number. Watch this. Ne uh, foil this. Use foil. First times first is 1. Outside times outside is plus 2i. Inside times inside is minus 2i. Last times last is minus 4i squared. The 2i's cancel. i squared is negative 1, leaving you with 1 plus 4 in the bottom, 5. We get negative 5 minus 10i over 5. Hey, guess what? Everything is good. That equals this. This number is the same as this number. It's just disguised. Fun with complex numbers. Sometimes things are the same, even though they look very different. Because those are the same, that means we're getting the same solution set for the second equation, which still doesn't prove, well, OK. Looks like we haven't made a mistake. Let's just say it that way. Looks like everything's good so far. Do I have to do all this with the second eigenvalue? Negative 4 minus 2i. Here is the first bit of good news. No, you don't. It's good enough just to do one eigenvalue and the corresponding eigenvector of when you have a complex eigenvalue and eigenvector. I haven't told you why yet. We'll get to that. It turns out the function y of t equals e to the lambda t where lambda is this, negative 4 plus 2i, times this complex eigenvector v, 
it turns out that this expression is a solution of the differential equation. I haven't told you what this means here. More fun with E today. I'm not going to check it algebraically. Actually, you can check it abstractly. E to the lambda t times v is always a solution of the corresponding differential equation when lambda is an eigenvalue of the matrix and v is a corresponding eigenvector. And it doesn't matter whether these are real numbers and vectors or complex <coughs> numbers and vectors. The algebra is exactly the same. But what does it mean? And can it be simplified? And can we find the real answer? Here are the simplifications you have to do. Turns out you want to first take this exponential function and write it in this way using a property of exponents, assuming it still works when you've got complex numbers up there. I'm making an assumption there that that still works. It does. The next thing we do is you replace this expression, e to the i times 2t, with an expression involving cosines and sines. It's all very mysterious, I know. In this class, Euler comes up in a couple places. We've got Euler's method. We also have Euler's formula, or Euler's identity. e to the i theta equals cos theta plus i sine theta. Huh? Where does this come from? Well, don't worry about it for the moment. This does lead to the most beautiful equation in the universe, by the way. If you replace theta with pi and use the fact that sine pi is 0 and cosine pi is negative 1, you get e to the i pi equals negative 1, or as I prefer, e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0, the most beautiful equation in the universe. Everyone will agree. You get captured by aliens, they will agree. They'll let you free if you tell them that most beautiful equation in the universe. Why? Because it's got the five most important numbers in the universe. 0, 1, e, i, pi. It's got the three most important operations, addition, multiplication, and exponentiation. And it's got the most important equivalence relation, equality. Hands down, the most beautiful equation in the universe. Okay? Follows from Euler's identity, which is a more general thing. Sorry, physicists. H bar and C are not the most important constants in the universe, important numbers, because they're not numbers. They are constants, they're physical constants, but they're not numbers, did you know that? H bar is not a number, C is not a number. Why? Why are they not numbers? They're physical constants, but physical constants are not numbers in general. Because they have units. Their values depend on the scale you use. That's why they're not numbers. Anyway. Uh, this is mysterious. You can take this as a definition, essentially. You can also derive it if you assume that Taylor series for e to the x cosine of x and sine of x works when you replace <coughs> x with i theta. I would encourage you to look that up on the internet, in fact. You can find derivations of Euler's formula. Number file, if you've ever looked for number file, I believe they have a derivation. It's pretty cool. I would encourage you to look it up. We're just going to use it here. Replace theta with 2t. We are going somewhere with this. It's not for nothing. What do you do with this? You want to simplify it some more. What we want to do is we want to write it as something plus i times something else, where the something and the something else are real. Question? Did you forget it too? Yes, I did. Okay. <coughs> it's 
good on making these mistakes so you guys can stay awake and stay on top of it here. In the top, that's a 1 up there, so you can just multiply this entire complex scalar times 1 and put it up there. And I think I'll multiply the e to the 4t through like this. On the bottom, it's a bit trickier, and I better leave myself more room. You've got to multiply this entire thing I've circled times that, negative 1 minus 2i. Foil it, actually. Each term is going to have an e to the negative 4t factor, but focus on this times that. First times first is cos 2t times negative 1. That's going to be one part that does not have an i with it. What's the other part that won't have an i with it? Last times last. i sine 2t times negative 2i, think, think, think. That'll be negative 2i squared sine 2t. i squared is negative 1. It'll go away <coughs> and become positive 2 sine 2t. Don't forget to eat the e to the 4t. And don't forget the 2 like I just about did. That's the part that does not involve an i. That's the real part of the answer. We're not done, though. What about the part that does involve an i? That's going to come from the outside and inside terms from FOIL. Right? You all know what I'm talking about when I say FOIL. Expanding the product of two binomials, first times first, outside times outside, inside times inside, and last times last. Outside times outside, look at my fingers, cos 2t times negative 2i will be negative 2i cos 2t. I factor <coughs> out the i there. I also don't want to forget the e to the negative 4t, so I would get, careful, negative 2e to the negative 4t. It's negative 4t. e to the negative 4t cos 2t. See how easy it is to make mistakes in all of this. I didn't get myself quite enough room. Inside times inside. That times that. Factor the i out, factor the e, well, put the e to the negative 4t through. I'm going to get minus e to the negative 4t sine 2t. Yikes! This Crazy looking vector can be se separated into a real part plus i times an imaginary part. This part here, I wish I had colored chalk, is the real part. This part here is the so called imaginary <coughs> part. It's a real vector, but it gets multiplied by the i. Here's the magic in all this. These two real valued vector functions are two solutions of the original system that are real, non imaginary, non complex. So, the general solution, maybe I'll factor the e to the negative 4t back out again. The general solution of the original system. of original. And it's real, there are no imaginary numbers involved. Is k1 times the first thing I circled. I can leave the e to the four, negative 4t as is, or I can factor it out. I probably should have left it factored out to begin with. I haven't made any mistakes. I get that plus k2, another arbitrary constant, times the second thing I circled without an i. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. 
e to the negative 4 t out, tail factor it out there. Very easy to make mistakes, but uh, hopefully that's right. What does D solve value give? I've got, by the way, I used a couple mathematical commands first and last to help me define my right hand side function, little f and little g here. To be negative 5x minus y and 5x minus 3y. D solve value, does it give the same thing? I'm not sure how if it's going to look the same or not, to tell you the truth. It should be equivalent, but remember, there's infinitely many ways of writing a general solution. I'm not sure how similar it would look. I hope it's at least recognizable as equivalent. I might have to expand it. Okay, well, so the C1 is like the K1 and the C2 is like the K2. You do see the E to the negative 4 T's in there. You see these fractions, 1 half, 5 halves, negative 1 half, positive 1 half. I mean, in a sense, that can be absorbed into the constant, um, though their proportionality should be the same. there times the k2 and a 2 cosine 2t plus 2 sine 2t with opposite signs, positive negative. Just like this negative one half and that positive one half have opposite signs. I think that's equivalent. Essentially this negative one half times c2 is actually like <coughs> k2. And back over here Two cos that doesn't look as good. That part doesn't look as good, so that's making me feel less confident about it. I'm not sure if I haven't made a mistake, okay? I'm gonna type this stuff into Mathematica after class and I'll check it. Nobody sees any more mistakes, do we? Okay, uh, I think what we'll do in the time we have remaining, we'll go, we'll go a little over time here, is skip the proof. Friday we'll focus more on proofs for sure. And go back to the matrix exponential and close. I did say in the email from Sunday that there will be a, a thing related to the matrix exponential and flows on the test. Let's go back to the original sync example that was a non-spiral sync. Again, you can check these eigenvalue and eigenvector computations. I don't have to re-enter this stuff, but these are codes you can do to check. This works also for the complex case. Okay, and I'll, before I put it on the wall, I'll check that as well for the complex example. What do you need to know? This is a key fact I mentioned. In fact, this is what I call the beautiful generalization. Maybe I should go ahead and call it the beautiful generalization here. Bigger. Writing it by hand, this expression is the unique solution in this initial value problem. Right there, that involves a matrix exponential. Not e to the a, but e to the t times a, where t is your variable, your independent variable time. t times a, t is a scalar, is found by multiplying each entry of a by t, just like we did with 1 half and 1 sixth and 1 24th and 1 over 120. 
or the matrix exponential examples will do. That t gets multiplied by a to create a matrix, and it's that matrix whose matrix exponential you form to get a new matrix. Multiply that by your initial value, your initial vector, that's your initial condition. That function solves this differential equation and this initial value problem. That's something to know, a fact to know for the test. You do not know, have to know how to calculate matrix exponentials, although I suppose I could require it for the diagonal case, based on what I said earlier. I will give you the matrix exponential value, the output of matrix x. In this example, what does that output look like? This function looks like that. This was the non-spiral sync example, so you don't see any cosines and sines here. By the way, hopefully it's clear now why it spirals with that spiral sync example, because I've got cosines and sines in there, in addition to the exponential decay. Does that function satisfy the initial value problem? This checks that it satisfies the initial condition. Plug in t equals 0, you get the initial condition. Does it satisfy the differential equation? Its derivative should equal a times itself. When I enter these things, I should get the same thing. And I do. It generates the corresponding flow. Yikes, flow. What is a flow? Here's the symbolism I've used before. Fancy phi with a t up there that's not an exponent but acts like an exponent. It's not though. This is a family of functions. In this case, functions of a vector variable. One function for each value of t. Its formula is the exact same formula as the other function where this is thought of as a solution of the differential equation, except now we get rid of the zero. Y is still the initial condition here in this symbolism. Initially, I wrote it as Y zero to emphasize it as being fixed, but now we think of it as a variable. For each fixed T, this is a function of Y. Back in the one-dimensional case, the graphs of these things were straight lines. What are they in this higher dimensional case? can't graph them as straight lines anymore, but they are linear functions. This is, for a fixed value of t, a linear function of x and y. You only see x and y to the first power. Think of these e's with t's as being fixed numbers for any fixed value of t. What's is it, its importance? Just like on exam one, you should know how it's related to solutions by iteration. You use this recursive equation right here, based on a certain initial condition, y0, and you iterate this function, meaning you plug y0 into it for a fixed value of t, like t equals 1, the time 1 map. You see where the, the point is after one moment in time goes by. It matches what happens with the differential equation. If you follow the solution curve for one, moment, for one unit of time, you'll end up at the same point. Apply the function again, plug y1 into it to get y2, you get a new point. That's where you're going to be after two units of time have gone by from the original one. It's matching up the differential equation when the equation is autonomous, as we were dealing with here. Next list and table in this kind of situation give you the same points. That's the thing to see here. But more importantly now, give me one minute. More importantly now, we want to understand what happens two entire sets of points under this flow. And that's where the cool animations come in. I don't claim you're going to understand this right away, but with time and work, we can. What do I have here? I have created a set, a parallelogram in fact, with parametric plot and these auxiliary variables that I've called u and v. And what I want to imagine is I want to imagine that parallelogram as sitting in a thin sheet of fluid. Maybe it's like a parallelogram shaped oil spill. Nasty example. And what's going to happen is it's going to follow the flow. As time goes by, we watch how this thing follows the flow. 
play this. And you see it moving with the water molecules. It's changing shape. It stays a parallelogram in this case, though the parallelogram gets skinnier and skinnier. And ultimately, if I let this go further and further, it would actually would, um, in, this is a non-spiral example, actually, so it's not going to rotate around the origin. With spiral sinks, they rotate around the origin as they go. You don't have to stick with parallelograms. You can use other shapes. This one, we see what happens with a circle or a disk, is a better way to call it here, and see how that moves under the flow. Okay, so we really are getting back to the fluid flow kind of application, not worrying about how realistic it is. Can fluid really do that? We're not getting into that, but we are thinking about it and using that as an imaginary application because it helps you understand. All right, thanks for bearing with me longer than that. See you on Friday.